Washington, D.C. Some people say the swamp, but I will not say that today. I refuse. This is too, too important, what we're doing. One of the most important deals and the most important trade deal we've ever made by far. I want to thank Senator Joni Ernst for being here. Joni, thank you very much, of Iowa. And I'll be there very soon. We'll be doing something very important in Iowa. But this is maybe more important than all of it put together, right, Joni? So I want to thank you for being here. Uh, Congressman Holding, Congressman Rowe, Congressman Newhouse and Congressman Meadows, thank you all for being here. We very much appreciate it. You've been very instrumental. Thank you. I'm thrilled to speak to the American people to share truly historic news for our nation and, indeed, for the world. I want to thank Vice President Pence for joining us this morning. It's my great honor to announce that we have successfully completed negotiations on a brand new deal to terminate and replace NAFTA and the NAFTA trade agreements with an incredible new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement called U.S.-MCA. It sort of just works. MCA. U.S.-MCA. And that'll be the name, I guess, that 99 percent of the time we'll be hearing, USMCA. Has a good ring to it. I have long contended that NAFTA was perhaps the worst trade deal ever made. Since NAFTA's adoption, the United States racked up trade deficits totaling more than $2 trillion. And it's a much higher number than that. With Canada and Mexico, it lost vast amounts of money and lost 4.1 million manufacturing jobs and one in four auto jobs. It lost about 25 percent of our auto jobs, even more than that. Throughout the campaign, I promised to renegotiate NAFTA, and today we have kept that promise. But for 25 years as a civilian, as a businessman, I used to say, how could anybody have signed a deal like NAFTA? And I watched New England and so many other places where I was uh, just the factories were leaving, the jobs were leaving, people were being fired, and uh, we can't have that. So we have negotiated this new agreement based on the principle of fairness and reciprocity. To me, it's the most important word in trade, because we've been treated so unfairly by so many nations all over the world, and we're changing that. We just signed a much better deal with South Korea. We had a horrible, horrible deal, and we just signed that at United Nations, and that's worked out well, and they're happy, we're happy. It's good for jobs, good for a lot of things. When that deal was signed, they said 250,000 jobs will be given be by signing this transaction, and they were right. I've said it before, they were right. 250,000 jobs to South Korea, not to the United States. So that's changed, and very much for the better, and this one is a brand new deal. The agreement will govern nearly $1.2 trillion in trade, which makes it the biggest trade deal in the United States history. I want to congratulate U.S. Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer, who has worked. Nobody understands how hard he's worked. No matter when you called him, he was in the office, or he was in somebody else's office doing the same thing. Hey, Bob Lighthizer is great. I've heard it for years. I said, if I ever do this, I want to get Lighthizer to represent us, because he felt the way I did. And the entire team at the USTR standing behind me, and some right here in the audience. I want to thank you all. Fantastic job. Peter Navarro, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Fantastic group of people. They love our country. I also want to thank Secretary Mnuchin, Secretary Ross, Secretary Nielsen, Secretary Perdue, Jared Kushner, Peter Navarro, and the United States Ambassador to Canada, Kelly Kraft. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Very much. I also want to thank President Peña Nieto of Mexico, who we had a few disagreements, but I really like him a lot. I think he may like me, I'm not sure. 
But I think he's a terrific person, and he'll be leaving uh, soon. But he's really done a good job and wonderful, wonderful person. And the Mexican president-elect, Lopez Obrador, who has given his support to this agreement. And we're developing a really good relationship, which I think is very important for our country, frankly, and for Mexico. And uh, so they worked together on this. This was done by both. I said, look, I don't want to sign an agreement. And then a new president comes in. They don't like it, and we have difficulty. Uh, they worked very much together on it, and I appreciate it from both. Uh, I have to certainly give my highest regards to Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. Uh, a lot of stories came out about uh, Justin and I uh, having difficulty together, and we did over the trade deal. But I'll tell you, it's turned out to be a very, very good deal for both and a very, very good deal for all three. It puts us in a position that we've never been in before. It's very good when you look at the world and what the world is doing and what — when you look at the unfair trade practices that countries are using against the United States. Uh, this is a terrific deal for all of us. Once approved by Congress, this new deal will be the most modern, up-to-date, and balanced trade agreement in the history of our country with the most advanced protections for workers ever developed. If you look at the reviews, people that would normally not, under any circumstances, say good things, because automatically they have to say bad. Even some Democrats say that's amazing. We had some they, — they haven't been given the sound bites yet, I guess, Mike. But actually, you had some Democrats say, this is really amazing if he really got all of that. But by uh, tomorrow, I would suspect they'll change their tune. But that's okay, because people know how good it is. It's an amazing deal for a lot of people. Likewise, it will be the most advanced trade deal in the world with ambitious provisions on the digital economy, patents — very important — financial services, and other areas where the United States has a strong competitive advantage. Mexico and Canada have agreed to strong new labor protections environmental protections, and new protections for intellectual property. So important. This new deal is an especially great victory for our farmers. Our farmers have gone through a lot over the last 15 years. They've been taken advantage of by everybody. Prices have gone way down. And we're working on some other deals that are going to make them very happy also. But this is a very, very big deal for our farmers. Uh, Mexico and Canada will be opened up a lot more than they are now. And I think there'll be a better spirit between the three countries, which is important for our farmers. The agreement will give our farmers and ranchers far greater access to sell American-grown produce in Mexico and in Canada. The deal includes a substantial increase in our farmers' opportunities to export American wheat poultry, eggs, and dairy, including milk, butter, cheese, yogurt, and ice cream, to name a few. I want to be very specific. I want to be very specific, eh? right? And many other products, but those products uh, were not really being treated fairly as far as those that worked so hard to produce them. And now they're going to be treated fairly. These measures will support many hundreds of thousands of American jobs. This is also a historic win for American manufacturers and American auto workers who have been treated so badly. We've lost so many jobs over the years under NAFTA. Under the current New Deal, and if you look at the current NAFTA deal, the New Deal is taking care of all of these problems, because NAFTA, foreign companies have been allowed to manufacture many of their parts overseas, ship them to Mexico and Canada for assembly, and send their foreign-made cars into the United States with no tax. So we let all our people go. We fire everybody. They make cars. They make products. They make everything in another country. They send them into the United States, no tax. And the cost is very little different. Sometimes it's more for those people that like to talk about cost. With this agreement, we are closing all of these terrible loopholes. They're closed. They're gone. They were a disaster. 
For example, we are requiring a large portion of every car to be made by high-wage workers, which will greatly reduce foreign outsourcing, which was a tremendous problem, and means more auto parts and automobiles will be manufactured inside the United States. We will be manufacturing many more cars. And our companies won't be leaving the United States, firing their workers and building their cars elsewhere. There's no longer that incentive. Before, under the NAFTA deal, they had that incentive. They have the opposite incentive now. We're not going to be losing our companies. That was, to me, the most important thing. I don't want to see our companies leave and fire our workers, and our workers never get jobs to replace those jobs. Those days are over. This deal will also impose new standards requiring at least 75 percent of every automobile to be made in North America in order to qualify for the privilege of free access to our markets. And that's what it is. It's a privilege. We don't take it as a privilege. We don't take it as a privilege. It's a privilege for them to do business with us. And I'm not talking about Mexico. I'm talking about everybody. Everybody. It's a privilege for China to do business with us. It's a privilege for the European Union, who has treated us very badly, but that's coming along, to do business with us. Japan, every country, it's a privilege for them to come in and attack the piggy bank. In this, we will have a result of much more happening right here in the United States. It means more than anything else, far more American jobs, and these are high-quality jobs. There are also strong provisions to enforce what's called the Rules of Origin requirements. This will incentivize billions of dollars in new purchases of U.S.-made automobiles. Once approved, this will be a new dawn for the American auto industry and for the American auto worker. They will see. They understand. They voted for us in large numbers, even though their leadership always goes Democrat. A couple of them said to me, I don't know how I can do it again. Many of them, the leaders would back Democrats and would tell me, you're going to get most of the votes from union workers. And we got most of the votes from workers, period. But the American auto worker was very much behind what we were doing as one primary aspect. It will transform North America back into a manufacturing powerhouse. If you remember, the previous administration said, we're not going to have manufacturing jobs anymore, essentially. We're not going to have — we're not going to make things anymore? No. Just the opposite. We're going to be a manufacturing powerhouse and allow us to reclaim a supply chain that has been offshored to the world because of unfair trade issues. We also provide brand-new intellectual property protections for biologic drugs, which will make North America a haven for medical innovation and development. We want our drugs to be made here. When you talk prescription drugs, we don't like getting them from foreign countries. We don't know what's happening with those drugs, how they're being made. Too important. This landmark agreement will send cash and jobs pouring into the United States and into North America good for Canada, good for Mexico. Instead of jobs leaving for overseas, they will be returning back home. And we've already had it. We have many, many car companies. I was with Prime Minister Abe of Japan. He said, we have sent many car companies to the United States over the last year and a half. It's true. And big expansions. And very importantly, he said, many more are coming because they have an incentive now to be here. People want to be back in the United States again. As I say, the United States is respected again, but it's also respected as to trade and industry. This is a truly extraordinary agreement for the United States, Canada, and Mexico. President Peñeto, it's so important uh, that the President and I have developed uh, this sort of a bond, a bond on trade. Peña Nieto, a man that has done a very good job for Mexico in terms of trade, and Prime Minister Trudeau, who I just spoke to, just spoke to both of them a little while ago. Uh, they love their countries. They want to do right for their countries, and that's what they've done. 
And we've really formed, if you look at this agreement, we formed a great partnership with Mexico and with Canada. And I plan to sign the agreement by the end of November. I then will submit it for approval to Congress, where, in theory, there should be no trouble. But anything you submit to Congress is trouble, uh, no matter what. It's the single greatest agreement ever signed. They'll say, well, you know, Trump likes it, therefore, we're not going to approve it, because that would be good for the Republicans. So, therefore, we can't approve it. But it will be uh, sent to Congress pursuant to the Trade Promotion Authority Act. This agreement follows on the heels of our successful completion of a new and balanced trade deal with South Korea. Tremendous difference in that deal from what it was. It was a disaster, as I said. To improve the old deal that had killed so many jobs. It also follows on our announcement last week of a new trade negotiation with Japan. Japan would never negotiate with the United States. They say, we're not going to negotiate. They told the previous administration, we're not going to negotiate. I said, you don't have to negotiate, but we're going to put a very, very substantial tax on your car if you don't. By the way, without tariffs, we wouldn't be talking about a deal. Just for those babies out there that keep talking about tariffs, that includes Congress. Oh, please don't charge tariffs. Without tariffs, you wouldn't be — we wouldn't be standing here. I can tell you, Bob and all of these folks would not be standing here right now. And we're totally prepared to do that if they don't negotiate. But Japan is uh, wanting to negotiate. Actually, they called about three weeks ago. And he's a terrific man, a terrific — just had a tremendous victory. And uh, they said, we'd like to start negotiations immediately. India, which is the tariff king, they called us and they say, we want to start negotiations immediately. When Bob Lighthizer said, what happened? He would never do this. They said, no, we want to keep your president happy. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? It's true. They have to keep us happy because they understand that we're wise to what's been happening. India charges tariffs of 100 percent. And then if we want to put a tariff of 25 percent on, people will call from Congress. But that's not free trade. And I'd look back to people and say, where do these people come from? Where do they come from? So because of the power of tariffs and the power that we have with tariffs, we, in many cases, won't even have to use them. That's how powerful they are and how good they are. But in many cases, we're not going to have to use them. And many, in many cases, uh, countries that are charging massive tariffs are eliminating those tariffs. As you know, we have $250 billion at 25 percent interest with China right now. And we could go $267 billion more. And China wants to talk very badly. And I said, frankly, it's too early to talk. Can't talk now because they're not ready, because they've been ripping us for so many years, it doesn't happen that quickly. And if politically people force it too quickly, you're not going to make the right deal for our workers and for our country. But China wants to talk, and we want to talk to them. And we want them to help us with North Korea. We want them to continue to help us with North Korea. That's very important. The European Union has been very tough on the United States. Last year, and for many years, they've lost in the vicinity of $150 billion a year. They have massive trade barriers. And they didn't want to come. They didn't want to talk. Jean-Claude, great business person, head of the European Union. Jean-Claude, my friend. I'd say, Jean-Claude, we want to make a deal. He goes, no, 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 we are very happy. I said, you may be happy, but I'm not happy because we have one of the worst deals of any group. We have one of the worst deals with the European Union. And they just didn't want to come because they were happy with the deal. I said, but we're not happy with the deal. And finally, after, you know, going through a whole process, I said, look, we're just going to put a tax of 20 percent on all of the millions of Mercedes and BMWs, all of the cars, the millions and millions of cars that they sell here that they won't take over there farm product that they won't take over there because they have barriers. You can't sell. You're not allowed to. Our farmers aren't allowed to sell over there many of their products, much of their products, most of them. And so I announced that we're going to put a 20 percent tariff, could be 25, on their cars coming in. And uh, they immediately called and said, we'd like to start negotiations. And we're having a successful negotiation. We'll see what happens. Who knows? 
I always say, who knows? But we'll see. I have a feeling we'll be successful. A pillar of national security is economic security and trade. National security is not where we lose hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Over the last five years, we've averaged $800 billion a year loss on trade. How dumb is that? $800 billion. This group doesn't know about those numbers. I don't even want them to hear those numbers. But the United States and its trade deals has lost, on average, almost $800 billion a year. That's dealing with China, dealing with European Union, European, with everybody. Japan, Mexico, Canada, everybody. And we're not going to allow that to happen. Manufacturing base and manufacturing sector, those are all in really essential ingredients to national security. We can't allow what's been happening over the last 25 years to happen. We're building our military like never before. It will be the strongest it ever was. And all of those jets that are made and rockets and missiles and ships, they're all being made in the United States. Jobs. Our economy is booming like never before. Jobless claims are at a 50-year low. The stock market is at a all-time high. Think of that. Over 50 percent since my election, 50 percent. People, the 401ks, and they have 401ks, and they were dying with them for years. Now they're so happy. I was telling the story I often tell of a policeman in New York came up. His wife was always very upset with him as an investor because he wasn't doing well with the 401ks. Now she thinks he's a genius because the numbers are so crazy. But we're up over 50 percent since the election. And you've heard me say this many times, but African-American unemployment, Asian unemployment, Hispanic unemployment is at record lows in history. Not, you know, for the last two years. The history of our country, African-American, Asian, Hispanic, young people without high school diplomas, all at historic, that's a very important sector, all at historic lows, the lowest in history. It's really something that's great. This is helping so much with people that get out of prison. We have a tremendous problem. People come out of prison, they can't get a job. Employers don't want to hire them. The economy is so good, they're hiring them, and they're turning out to be incredible workers. They're given a chance. They're really given a second given a third chance in some cases. But I've had numerous employers come up and say, I'll tell you what, I've taken people that were in prison, and we've hired them. He wouldn't have done this in a normal economy or a bad economy, only in this kind of an economy. And now he's like the biggest fan. One man in particular has taken numerous people. He said most of them have been unbelievable. All you can ask is most. But most of them have been unbelievable. That's a great thing. That's a really great thing. It gives them a chance. So before we take questions, I want to extend our warmest condolences to the country of Indonesia. Friend of mine, we're going to be calling up the leader, who is a great leader indeed. But they got hit by a giant tsunami, uh, like people have not seen. This part of the world hasn't seen it so much, fortunately. They say that's the worst of all. You look at the tornadoes, the hurricanes, you look at all of the different natural disasters. A friend of mine who studies natural disasters, I don't know why he does that, but he does. He says this, that tsunami is the worst of all, and uh, they got hit very hard, and probably thousands of people killed. We have already sent a lot of first responders and military and others to help. Uh, but it's a really bad, bad situation. And finally, before closing, I want to send our thoughts and prayers to the victims of the Las Vegas shooting. That was a horrible, horrible time in the life of our country. It took place exactly one year ago today. All of America is grieving for the lives lost and for the families 
they left behind. So to all of those families and to the people of Las Vegas, we love you. We are with you. We're working with you very hard. That was a terrible, terrible event. So thank you very much for that. I want to uh, ask uh, Bob Lighthizer, who uh, is just a terrific individual as well as a man that knows a lot about this subject, to come up and say a word about the uh, U.S. MCA, the new agreement. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll take some questions after that, please. Bob. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Before I start, I would just like to give a vignette, because <clears throat> I think it says something about working for the President. So August 16th of last year, we started this process. And I'm at a hotel in Washington, and there's like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people waiting to have the introduction of, uh, of myself and my two counterparts, one from Canada, one from the United States. And I'm getting, we're lined up, and I, and I get a call that says the president wants to talk to you. So I go into the little ante room, and I get the, on the cell phone, and the president starts talking, and everybody's kind of waiting, and he's talking, and he's going through what he wants to get done in NAFTA and his problems with it, all of which he's qu quite familiar with. And then he finally says two things which I thought were telling. One, he said, Bob, I will back you up like no other USTR has been backed up in history. And then the second thing, and he did that, by the way, and then the second thing he said was, he said, now go out there and have fun. And I thought, well, it's probably not going to be as much fun from my side as it will be from your side. But I'm proud to be on your team, and I really am proud to, 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 to follow you through this and the, other, uh, and the other trade changes. As you have said, Mr. President, this agreement is historic in many ways. The USMCA will cover $1.2 trillion, easily making it the biggest agreement in history. Uh, we have done this in 14 months. And believe me, in trade negotiating terms, that's like warp speed. When we began these negotiations last year, the President's instructions to me were precise and straightforward. Protect American workers, fight for our farmers and ranchers, preserve America's competitive innovation edge, secure greater access for our businesses, and above all, bring back jobs to America. I think we have succeeded with this agreement. The USMCA will accelerate the manufacturing renaissance our country has enjoyed under President Trump. It will bring our trading relationship with Mexico and Canada into the 21st century, and it will protect America's competitive age in digital and, and innovation uh, across the economy. The new agreement will also serve as a template for our trade agreements under the Trump, uh, under the Trump administration in the future. This paradigm-shifting model rests on three pillars. The first pillar is fairness. We have negotiated stronger rules of origin for automobiles, which will bring billions of dollars of manufacturing back to America. We have secured greater market access for our farmers and ranchers. We've agreed to unprecedented labor standards that will help level the playing field for our workers. We've also agreed to a first-of-its-kind review and termination provision which will ensure that the USMCA, unlike NAFTA, will not become unbalanced and out of date. The second pillar will consist of a host of ambitious provisions on digital trade, intellectual property, services, including financial services, designed to protect our competitive edge. The third pillar consists of new provisions designed to eliminate unfair trade practices, including strong new disciplines on state-owned enterprises, on currency manipulation, relations with non-market economies, and much, much more. We wouldn't be here today if it were not for several people who contributed so much to this endeavor. First, the President's key advisor and my good friend, Jared Kushner, was my partner in leading the U.S. negotiating team. <clears throat> I've said before, and I'll say again, this agreement would not have happened if it wasn't for, for Jerry. So thank you very much.
I'd like to thank my counterparts, Secretary Guajardo and Minister Freeland, as well as other Mexican and Canadian government officials, including Secretary Vidigray, uh, Ambassador Ciade, Jerry Butts, and Katie Telford of Canada, and so many more. I'd also like to thank the wonderful staff at USTR, many of whom are on here. I like to think of us a little bit like we were the Marine Corps, and so I like the name particularly of this, of this agreement. <laughs> USTR is about 250 people, and they're all devoted, and they're all exceptional, and they all work round the clock. Many of the people you're looking at spent more than one night in the office over the course of the last few weeks. Uh, and they have enormous ability, and this president has unleashed them. Finally, I would like to thank President Trump. Your leadership, vision, and grit made this agreement possible. No other person could have done it. Millions of Americans will benefit for years to come because of this vision and probably even more important, this grit. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, some questions? Uh, yes, Steve, question? Thank you, sir. Um, you, you've had tensions with Prime Minister Trudeau. Yes. How did that affect your ability to get this deal done? I don't think it did. He's a professional. I'm a professional. We had very strong tensions. Uh, uh, it, it was just an unfair deal, whether it was Mexico or Canada. And now it's a fair deal for everybody. It's a much different deal. It's a brand new deal. It's not NAFTA redone. It's a brand new deal. Uh, I just spoke with him. We have a great relationship, and we're going to work as a partner. Don't forget, uh, the rest of the world uh, is looking to take advantage of us, and as a region, you might say. And we're going to work very closely together with Canada and with Mexico, uh, because we'll be able to compete with anybody. We have, we have things that nobody else has. We have energy that nobody else has. We have timber that nobody else has. We have things that no other part of the world has to the extent that we have. So we're going to do very well together. Uh, I think we have there was a lot of tension, I will say, uh, between he and I, I think, more specifically. And it, it's all worked out. You know when it ended? About 12 o'clock last night. And you mentioned the— But he's a good man. He's done a good job, and he, he loves the people of Canada. You mentioned the $267 billion and possible more tariffs on China. What does China need to do to avoid that? Well, we'll see what happens with China. We have lost $375 billion in trade deficits, they have a surplus of $375 billion, with a B, with the United States. And it's been that way for years and years and years. I always say, we rebuilt China. They took that money, and they built fighter jets, and they built uh, bridges. They built more bridges than we've built in the last 100 years, probably, big ones, like the George Washington Bridge, like big bridges. And uh, I'm not going to take you know, look, I don't blame China. I blame our leadership. They should have never let that happen. And I told that to President Xi. I said, you know, I was making a speech in China, and I was really hitting China hard. And I'm in China. I don't know if that's a good thing to do. But I looked at it, and I said, but, you know, I don't really blame you. I blame our leadership for allowing this to happen. He knew exactly what I meant. We had no deal with China. I asked one of the top people in China, a representative at the highest level, came to the Oval Office. I said, let me ask you, how did this ever happen? He's a pro, so he understands. He doesn't have to be cute. He said, nobody ever did anything from the United States. When we put on a 25 percent tariff on every car that comes from the United States into China, we thought we would be rebuked. We thought it would be terrible. Nobody ever called. Nobody did anything. That was years ago. And we charge them nothing, two and a half, but we don't collect it. We do now, by the way, but we don't collect the two and a half. So they charge 25. We charge essentially nothing. But I said, how did it happen? He said, nobody ever called. We don't have a deal with China. There's no deal. They do whatever they want. So we have a tremendous problem with theft of intellectual property with China. We have a lot of other problems with China. We have primarily trade problems. And as you know, they're having 
a much more difficult time now. I don't want them to have a difficult time. And we're doing better than we've ever done. Everybody talked about the tariffs. Oh, the tariffs, tariffs. You know, tariffs ended in 1913. And they then went to a different system in 1918, totally unrelated. And then in 1928, you had the Great Depression for a lot of different reasons, not necessarily our country's fault, but a little bit our country's fault. And then in the 1930s, they said, we better start charging some tariffs. We need money to come into our country again, okay? So I'm not advocating tariffs. I will tell you this, our steel industry, Wilbur, is stronger than it's been in 25 years. This has taken six months because I charged for the dumpers. They were dumping steel and dumping aluminum into our country. I charged 25 percent. That's a lot. Could be more, but that's a lot. And if you look at U.S. Steel and Nucor, Nucor just announced a billion-dollar plant, brand new, already started construction. U.S. Steel is building eight or nine plants. They're expanding plants. I don't think there's any industry like what's happened to steel in the last nine months, ten months, since I really started doing what I'm doing. Uh, it's been really pretty amazing. Aluminum also. So, and we need steel. We need steel for defense. What are we going to do? Go and say, oh, we'll get our steel from, a, like, another country? We can't do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can't do that. So we need steel, and we need it badly for defense. So I'm very proud of what's happened with the steel industry. Okay, question? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. She's shocked that I picked her. No. It's like in a state of shock. I'm not thinking, Mr. That's President. That's okay. I know you're not thinking. You never do. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. In a tweet this weekend, Mr. President, you said that it's incorrect to say you're limiting the scope of the FBI investigation. What does that have to do with trade? I don't mind answering the question, but, you know, I, I'd like to do the trade It has to do with the other right? headline in the news, which is the Kavanaugh I know, but, I know, but how about talking about trade, and then we'll get to that. We'll do that a little bit later. Do you think the trade, Anybody have a trade? Do you Go think ahead, your trade please. deal will pass through Congress, sir? Uh, I think so, but, you know, if it doesn't, we have lots of other alternatives. But I do think so. I think if they're fair which is a big question, but if it's fair on both sides, the Republicans love it, uh, industry loves it, our country loves it. Uh, if it's fair, it will pass. I think it'll pass easily, really easily, because it's a great deal. I mean, NAFTA passed. It's one of the worst deals I've ever seen. Inconceivable that it was made. Fair question. Any other questions Thank in trade? You. I'll get back to you on the other I, questions. I'd like to go forward with my Kavanaugh question. Let's do might. that later, it. and we'll, but I'll call you a second time. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. You have described India right now as a tariff king. Can you explain it a bit later? Well, India charges us tremendous tariffs. Uh, when we send uh, Harley-Davidson's, motorcycles, other things to India, they charge very, very high tariffs. And I've spoken to Prime Minister Modi, and he's going to reduce them very substantially. Nobody ever spoke to these people. He said, nobody ever spoke to me. In other words, we've had leaders here. I'm not you know, trying to be overly dramatic. We've had presidents of the United States and trade representatives. That are, they never spoke to India. Brazil's another one. That's a beauty. They charge us whatever they want. So if you ask some of the companies, they say Brazil is among the toughest in the world, maybe the toughest in the world. We don't call them and say, hey, you're treating our companies unfairly. You're treating our country unfairly. So India is a very, very high — they really charge tremendously high tariffs. On motorcycles, it was 100 percent. So you send a motorcycle into India, there's a 100 percent tariff. Now, that's so high that it's like a barrier. In other words, who's going to buy it? It costs you so much. Now, they've already reduced that substantially, but it's still too high. Uh, my relationship with uh, India is great. With Prime Minister Modi is great. And they're going to start doing a lot. They've already — they've called us to make a deal. We didn't even call them. They called us to make a deal, which is, like, shocking to people. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes. Well, I don't — there we go. Um, I do have a second question on the Kavanaugh thing, if, when you get back to it, if you take that. Let's go. But you'll take that now? No, no. Okay. Well, the trade. question First I have trade. on trade, the question I have on trade, does this mean the end of tariffs, if you could spell that out no. to Canada? No. It means, so do you think it it'll means, pass? No, no. Uh, the steel is staying where it is, and aluminum. 
but it means we probably, for the most part, won't be having to use tariffs unless we're unable to make a deal with a country. For instance, if we can't make a deal with the European Union, we will respectfully put tariffs on the cars. The United States will take in billions and billions of dollars into its coffers. Isn't that nice? Because you don't hear that. <laughs> Only it from Carl take Sagan. In, okay. <laughs> yes, Sagan. But it'll take in billions and billions of dollars. But really, what's going to happen is they'll make the cars in the United States. This way, they don't have to pay the 25 or the 20 percent tax. And could you spell So out? I don't think you're going to have to use the tariffs too often. But there will be cases where you have countries that are just absolutely not willing to do what's fair and reciprocal. And in that case, they'll pay tariffs. And you know what? The United States will do very well. Either way, we do very well. So do you think it'll pass in Canada, Mexico, and more importantly, I don't know. here I mean, in the United I, States? I can't tell you. All I know is we made a deal. The highly respected presidents, and in the case of Canada, the prime minister, uh, are satisfied with the deal. It's good for Canada, good for Mexico. It's good for all three. This is a deal. I'm not touting it. This is good for all three. That's good. And just that fact makes it good for us. But this is good for all three. But this is a much different deal than NAFTA. And this is much more of a reciprocal deal for the United States, which is really good. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. No, why don't you just — we'll do the Kavanaugh questions. I mean, uh, you talk about being treated harshly. Uh, we'll do that in a couple of — let's finish up trade, because you have a lot of people that want to run over to the Wall Street Journal and start writing. Go ahead, please. I can't hear you? A Mexican journalist? Go ahead. Yes. Sure. Uh, it's — so you're going to keep the tariffs on steel and aluminum on Mexico and Canada? Un until such time as — we can do something that would be uh, different, like quotas, perhaps, so that our industry is protected. We are not going to allow our steel industry to disappear. It was almost gone. I'll tell you what. If our country kept going the way it was going, within two years, you wouldn't have had a steel industry. We have to have a steel industry. We have to have an aluminum. You know, there are certain industries important. So uh, we are working on that now. That wasn't part of this. But we will do something. And in fact, Bob, if you want, you may want to say a couple of words about that, because we were literally talking about that one hour ago. Yes, yes. great. Thank you, Mr. President. I guess I would say, first of all, there are two separate things as far as we're concerned. We know that there are grave interests to both countries. We are engaging in talks now with an effort to try to preserve the, the effect of our program and still take care of their needs. And, and you know, hopefully, we'll be able to work that out. But we are in communication with them. And, and really take care of the needs of our steel companies. I don't want plants closing. They're hiring thousands of workers all over the country. I'm not giving that up. But, but you get the assurances of President -elect Lopez Obrador yeah. that he's yeah. going to keep his word on this trade. Oh, yeah, we have, a, we have a very good understanding, yeah. Really good. Uh, yes, sir, go ahead, please. I am, Mr. President. Just hoping you can uh, just reiterate on the tariffs. What specifically would it take for Canada or Mexico to be exempt from these tariffs? And secondly, did you consider dairy the deal breaker yes, when it came to Canada? Yes, dairy was a deal breaker. And now for our farmers, it's, as you know, substantially opened up much more. And I know they can't open it completely. They have farmers also. You know, they can't be overrun. And I fully under and I tell them that. I say, look, I understand you have limits, but they could do much better. And we've opened it up to our farmers. So the folks up in Wisconsin, I I'll tell you what, I went to Wisconsin, I went to Iowa. Joni knows better than anybody, right? And Scott Walker, who I think is a fantastic governor, talks about it all the time, that uh, our farmers were not treated properly by Canada. Now they're going to be treated with respect. Uh, they're going to be treated fairly. Or, as I say, in that reciprocal way. Very important. Yes, sir, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, it seems there was some give and take on both sides for this deal. I wonder what, in your view, would be your biggest concession to Canada and why you decided to make that concession. Number two, if you could dive in a bit more to, the, to your thoughts on Justin Trudeau. You talk about tensions. I wonder what you, throughout this process, what you've learned about him and what the state of the relationship is with him today and going forward? Well, I think my biggest concession would be making the deal. Because we are the one that people come and want to take from. I'm talking about every country. And 
that gives us a tremendous advantage in negotiating that we never used before with past administrations. We never used it. Every deal we have is a loser. Every deal. You could look at almost every country in the world, almost every country. We have trade deficits. We lose with everybody. So I think my biggest concession was making the deal because we could have done it a different way. But it would have been nasty, and it wouldn't have been nice. And I don't want to have that. We have a great relationship with Canada. I think now it'll be better than ever. Uh, all The only problem with Justin is he loves his people, and he's, you know, fighting hard for his people. Uh, I think we — you know, we've always had, actually, a very good relationship. It get a little — got a little bit testy in the last couple of months. But that was over this agreement. And I understand that. But, no, I think — I think uh, Justin's a good person who's doing a good job. He — he felt very committed to his people, and that's what he did. And, again, this is uh, — this is good for everybody. This is good for Canada, good for Mexico also. Yes. Yes, please. Please. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. As you mentioned, you're going to be signing this agreement, and your counterparts are going to be signing this agreement right. within the next 60 days. Right. Then it's up to Congress. Right. You're very confident. I get that. You're a confident guy. Not at all confident. <laughs> I'm not. Well, I don't explain know. to hey, me Congress, why you think that you if, tell me, if Congress you guys is controlled gonna sign by it, tell me. I think I think they will. If Congress is controlled by Democrats, could happen. Could it be. It could happen. So, so they're willing what? to throw what are the prospects. Yeah, they might be willing to throw one of the great deals for people. And the workers, they may be willing to do that for political — you know, people or political purposes, because, frankly, uh, you know, they'll have 2020 in mind. So far, I dream about 2020 when I look at what's going. They have 2020 in mind. They want to — they want to do as well as they can. And so trying to reject even great deals, like, this is a great deal for our country, great for other countries. But it's a great deal for our country and great for our worker. I can't tell you whether or not they will obstruct, whether or not they will resist. I mean, their whole campaign is resist. I see their signs all, resist. They don't even know what they're resisting. If you ask them, what are you resisting? Well, let me think about that. They can't ask. They had somebody on this weekend. They said, what are you resisting? And they were unable to answer the question. So, you know, I, I can't tell you about delay, obstruct, Resist, because, you know, right after this election — and I think we're going to do well, although history is not on our side. I guess in history, uh, generally, whoever has the White House doesn't do well in midterms. But well, the one difference is we have the greatest economy in the history of our country. I think that's a big difference. And that's one of our problems, too, because people that went out and voted for me — and they would be voting for me if I was on the ticket, but I'm not on the ticket. But Congress is on the ticket. And I try and tell my people that's the same thing as me. In a sense, that's the same thing. Think of it as the same thing as me. But I think we're going to do uh, well. I actually think. I mean, we have Senate races that weren't even in play six months ago. When I started looking at it closely, I won't mention names, but there were senators that were not in play. They were not even — and you know exactly what I'm talking about, numerous of them. They were not in play. In other words, let's not go here, let's not go to this state, four or five states. Now, it's the, — they're like even races. In one case, they're up two points. Now, who knows what happens? And, you know, as you know, there are a lot of them are rep repression polls or polls that aren't very accurate, because I see polls that I know are false, having to do with certain of the races. But we had areas and we had congressional seats, too, where I know it's going to be a positive outcome. But you look at what's going on, and it doesn't seem to — be broadcast that way. But I certainly had that with my election. They were telling me I was, you know, in trouble in certain states that I end up winning in a grand — like, in a, a landslide. And I knew I was going to win them in a landslide, but they wouldn't report it that way. You know why? Fake news. Okay. Right One last thing, you. Mr. Yes, President. right behind you, Do please. you believe that the trade agreement will be a major issue in the midterm elections? This well, it shouldn't agreement. be. Look, it's a good agreement. Uh, these people — you know, when I first did it, they said, oh, why don't you just extend NAFTA? They have no idea about business. Just extend NAFTA. That would have been a disaster. We're losing $100 billion a year in deficits, at least — at least to Mexico, under NAFTA. But just look at the results, and, and a substantial amount to Canada, although a lot of people try and say it's pretty much even. It's not even. We lose a substantial amount. So, you know, I think it's a very hard thing to defend. But that's all right. Look, I understand the world of politics, I think, as well as anybody. I haven't been doing it that long, but I actually have been, because I've been doing it on the other side. And I do understand. And 
you know, they can take the greatest thing ever done and try and make it sound as bad as possible. But this one's tough. This one, people are coming out for this one and saying, that's incredible what we've been able to do. Yes, behind you, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Now that you've answered several questions on trade, I'd like to turn uh, don't, don't, to don't Judge do Kavanaugh. Don't do, do you have, do you have uh, excuse me, do you have a question on trade? We'll we do just, one or two more questions on trade. You answered several questions okay, on trade. Okay, don't do that. That's not nice. Mr. President, and besides that, the, somebody is before you. Excuse me, don't do that. Do you have a question on trade? You answered several questions on trade. Do you have a trade? question on trade? My question is on Judge okay, Kavanaugh. Okay, please, yes, You said please. the FBI should interview whoever that they believe is appropriate. Does that include Julie Swetnick, the third accuser? And can you promise to release the full findings uh, me from the question, FBI please. after they finish their report, Mr. President? Give me your question, please. Mr. President, was the Give her the mic, please. Thank you very much. Was border security or funding yes. for the wall discussed during the negotiation, yes. and who will pay for the yes. wall? Yes, the wall. We're getting 1.6 billion for the wall this year. We got 1.6, 1.6. We have about 3.2 billion in the wall. We're doing a lot of work people don't realize. I don't really want to talk about it because I can build it quickly at one time, which is what I want. But, is, but is we've been building it over the last year and a half with uh, 3.2 billion, 1616, and we now have another 1.6. And I've got a big decision to make after the election as to whether or not we go for it. Because you know what? Border security to the people of our country, very important. The wall is a big factor in border security. And I really believe that the people of our country, they want the wall and they want border security. They don't want open borders like the Democrats want to have. They don't want crime pouring into our country. They don't want MS-13 pouring into our country. They don't want that. And I really think I have a very big decision to make sometime right after the election, very quickly, because you know what comes due after the election. Uh, do I want to do it before the election? Personally, yes. But I don't want to do that for a different reason, because I have some very fine people that are running in close races. And it may affect them, and it may not. It may be good for them. I happen to think it would be good for them. But border security for our country. Our people want security. The women of our country, they want security. They don't want to have thousands of people pouring across the border. And I'll tell you what, they want to have ICE, because ICE walks into MS-13 and these gangs, and they treat them like it's just another day in the office. They're rough and they're tough and they love our country. And I'm treating ICE good and I'm treating our law enforcement good. And the Democrats don't want to take care of our law enforcement. And the Democrats don't want to take care of our military. So we are going to have a decision to make sometime right after, very close to uh, after the election is over. And that will be on border security and the wall, but border security. The wall's a big factor. Okay, but was that do you want to do some conver questions? But was that part of the conversation and the negotiation that just Yes, it was. Yeah, we talked about it. With Mexico, we talked about it. Uh, it was a big part. And certain things and certain understandings are had. At the same time, we don't want to mix it up too much. This is a very big deal and a very good deal for everybody. But uh, border security and security generally is a very big factor. We also have drugs. Sometimes, and some people would say it's a very similar thing. But we talked about drugs with Mexico. That's a very, very big factor. Very, very big. We have a lot of good understandings, and we'll be discussing that with them. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, but it was a factor, absolutely, in, in the deal. Okay, let's go. Come on. You want to, I guess, get off trade. I don't know. You, people you. are falling asleep with trade. I think it's, the, to me, it's the most exciting thing you can talk about, right, Joni? Right? All right, let's go. Come on. Thank you, Mr. President. In a tweet this weekend, you said it's incorrect to say that you're limiting the scope of the FBI investigation into Judge Kavanaugh. But your own statement on Friday made it very clear. You said this investigation must be limited in scope. So which is it? Well, no, is I didn't there... say anything on Friday. What I said is, let the Senate decide whatever they want to do is okay with me. And also the FBI. I think the FBI should do what they have to do to get to the answer. At the same time, just so we all understand, this is our seventh investigation of a man who has really, you know, you look at his life until this happened. What a, what a change he's gone through. What his family's gone through. The trauma for a man that's never had any accusation, any He's never had a bad statement about him. He's led, I mean, I think he was number one in his class at Yale. He was number one in his law school at Yale. And then what he's gone through over the last three weeks is incredible. So uh, I want the FBI, this is now their seventh investigation. So it's not like they're, you know, just starting. 
Uh, I want them to do a very comprehensive uh, investigation, whatever that means, according to the senators and the Republicans and the Republican majority. I want them to do that. I want it to be comprehensive. I actually think it's a good thing for Judge Kavanaugh. I think it's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Now, with that being said, I'd like it to go quickly. And the reason I'd like it to go quickly, very simple. It's so simple. Because it's unfair to him at this point. What his wife is going through, what his beautiful children are going through, is not describable. It's not describable. It's not fair. I think it's fair to do it to me because, you know, I've been going from day one. I've been from long before I got to office, you've been doing it. It's almost became, I, I think for me, it's like a part of my job description to handle this crap. But as far as, as far as, this is a man that this is not from his world. And you know what? If they're not going to want him, and I think that would be a shame, I'm with him all the way. I mean, a charge made or said to have occurred 36 years ago, and nothing happened since. And, and look, I feel badly for all parties. I feel badly for everybody. I feel badly for our country. This is so bad for our country. But I will tell you, I watch those senators on the Democrat side, and I thought it was a disgrace, and partially because I know them. Are I know them too well. And you know what? They are not angels. Are you saying your White House has put no limitations on? No, my White House is doing FBI whatever the senators want. No, no. Who you don't they understand. should interview? You don't understand what I'm saying. You do understand. You just don't want to report it that way. Just so you understand, my White House will do whatever the senators want. I'm open to whatever they want. The one thing I want is speed. Now, they started, I believe, on Friday. Could have even been a little bit earlier than that. But they started. They have worked round the clock on Saturday, Sunday. They're working right now. I mean, they're covering a lot of territory. This is the seventh investigation of Judge Kavanaugh, number seven. This isn't number one. They started on Friday. They worked all weekend. They've gone late into the evenings. The FBI is really working hard, and they're putting in a lot of hours. So hopefully they can come up with what everybody's looking for. But no, I'm guided by the Senate. I want to make the Senate happy, because ultimately, they're making the judgment. I'm not making the judgment. I've already made my judgment. The Senate is making a judgment on Judge Kavanaugh. That's a very important thing to do. Je yes, go ahead, Peter. Go ahead. Just for clarity, so that it's just for clarity, so that it's clear. In fact, it's up to you to instruct the FBI what to do. It is up to me. It is up to me. But I'm instructing them as per what I feel the Senate wants. The Senate's making this decision, and I'm instructing them as per what the Senate is looking for. Just for clarity, will you uh, instruct the White House Counsel Don McGahn to give the FBI free reign to interview whomever they feel is necessary. Well, I have so instructed him, and I did it again over the weekend, because I see the press was, I don't want to use the word in this case, misleading. It's a much more complex subject than anybody would understand, and than most people understand. But essentially, I have done that. But I did also say within the bounds of what the Senate wants. So we don't want to go on a, to use a, an expression often used by me, we don't want to go on a witch hunt, do we? So just to be clear, should the FBI interview all three of Brett Kavanaugh's accusers? Uh, it wouldn't bother me at all. Now, it depends. I don't well, know all three of the accusers. All three. Certainly, I imagine they're going to interview two. Uh, the third one, I don't know much about, but it wouldn't bother me at all. I mean, I've been heard that the third one has, I have no idea if this is true, has very little credibility. If there is any credibility, interview the third one. But I want to interview, I want it to be done quickly because it's unfair to the family and to the judge. It's unfair, it's so unfair to his kids and his, his wife. How about, for the, how about for the accusers? Has this process been fair to them? Well, certainly we gave the doctor a tremendous uh, time, which is great. Uh, she spoke well, but, you know, there are some questions that haven't been answered, like what year was it? What day was it? Where was it? Do you know the location? Do you know the house? A lot of different things.
people are saying, well, you know, what's going on? With all of that, you cannot say that we've done anything but be respectful. And, and, I, and I do, and I respect her position very much. I respect her position very much. Uh, I believe, and again, this is Republican senators and this is the Senate, I believe they've been very respectful to the doctor, Dr. Ford. Isn't that why the FBI should interview all of them to exonerate Brett well, Kavanaugh? Well, yeah, Peter, I think the FBI should interview anybody that they want within reason. But Brett you have Kavanaugh. to say within reason. They should interview, but they should also be guided, and I'm being guided, by what the senators are looking for, because they have to make the choice. Go ahead. Now should, you can go. Should Brett Kavanaugh be interviewed by the FBI? I think so. I think it's fine if they do. I don't know. That's up to them. Uh, I think that he spoke very conclusively and very well. I think it's been a very rough period of time. I guarantee he's never had a period of time like this. When he was chosen, everybody said, oh, this is going to go so quickly. Look, people thought 10 years ago that Brett Kavanaugh was going to be a Supreme Court justice because of his intellect, because of his career, because of the fact that there are no games. You know, now they talk about alcohol. They talk about all of the things that you hear. And frankly, you take a look at — they're bringing up subjects. We would know about this over the last 20 years, 30 years of his career. You know, what happened? They're going back to high school, and they're saying he drank a lot one evening in high school. We, you know, I, I tell you what, I happen to know some United States senators. One who is on the other side, who's pretty aggressive. I've seen that person in very bad situations, okay? I've seen that person in very, very bad situations, somewhat compromising. And, you know, uh, I think it's very unfair to, to bring up things like this. However, whatever the senators want is okay with me. They're going to be making a decision Whatever they want is okay with me. Go ahead. Uh, that's enough, Peter. Go, please. Say it. Oh, I, I think the press has treated me unbelievably unfairly. In fact, when I won, I said, the good thing is now the press finally gets it. Now they'll finally treat me fairly. They got worse. They're worse now than ever. They're loco, but that's okay. I put up with it. Go ahead. Uh, you, I use that President. word because of the fact that we made a deal with Mexico. So. No, no, please sit down. Thank you, Mr. Go President, ahead. for coming oh, back to you. I'll, you're going to be next. You're going to be next. I didn't know. I thought you were talking. Go ahead. I have two questions about Judge Kavanaugh. First, there are now concerns that he may have lied or mischaracterized his drinking while testifying. If they find that he did, do you think that bars him from being your Supreme Court nominee? Well, I've watched. I watched him. I was surprised at how. Uh, vocally was about the fact that he likes beer, and he's had a little bit of difficulty. I mean, he talked about things that happened when he drank. I mean, this is not a man that said that alcohol was absent, that he was perfect with respect to alcohol. No, I thought he was actually, going back so many years, I thought he was uh, excellent. The interesting thing is, though, nobody asked him about what's happened in the last 25, 30 years during his professional career, because I, there were no bad reports. I mean, there are bad reports on everybody in here. Most of the people sitting down there are bad, except for Mike Pence, by the way. <laughs> and if we find one on him, then I'm, I think that's, that's going to be, that'll be the greatest shock of all time. So, no, there are bad reports on everybody. I'm looking at people. I'm sort of, look at some of these people asking the questions, okay? Look at Blumenthal. He lied about Vietnam. He didn't just say, hey, I went to Vietnam. No, no. For 15 years, he said he was a war hero. He fought in Da Nang province. We call him Da Nang Richard. Da Nang. That's his nickname, Da Nang. He never went to Vietnam. And he's up there saying, we need honesty and we need integrity. This guy lied when he was the Attorney General of Connecticut. He lied. I don't mean a little bit. And then when he got out, he actually dropped out of the race, and he won anyway, because Democrats always win in Connecticut. He won very close, probably the closest ever. But here's the guy lied, and now he's up there talking like he's holier than thou. You know what? Take a look at his record. And when he got out, and when he apologized, he was crying. The tears were all over the place. 
And now he acts like, how dare you? Take a look at the judge who has led an exemplary life. I mean, you're going back to high school because he had beer? I think the judge has been uh, pretty amazing about describing his situation with alcohol and with beer. I mean, take a look at Cory Booker. He ran Newark, New Jersey into the ground. He was a horrible mayor. And he made statements that when he was in high school or college, what he was doing, he actually made the statements. And now he's talking about Judge Kavanaugh. And I could go through a whole list of them, okay? So Look at Dianne Feinstein. You're telling me about time. Dianne Feinstein knew about this two months earlier. If she wanted a, a really thorough investigation, we had all the time in the world. She didn't have to wait till after the hearing was closed, essentially. She should have said, listen, I have a problem. I have this report. I'd like the FBI to look at it while we're doing the hearings. We had two months. No, she didn't do that. She waited till we were closed. And then she probably leaked it, but, you know, who am I to say? But she probably leaked it based on her very bad body language the other day. But more importantly, in a sense, for her to have waited that period of time, and now for you Democrats, and I guess I'm including you, too, the media, right? I consider you a part of the Democrat Party. But for you, for the Democrats, to be talking about, we want more time for the FBI. If you wanted more time for the FBI, why didn't Dianne Feinstein bring this up? Now, you know that she showed this to other Democrats. She's not the only one. She showed this to other Democrats. There were more than just her that knew about this big confidential thing. It was confidential until the hearing was over. After the hearing was over, they went public. Why didn't they do it during the hearing? And we could have had all the time in the world. You know why? Because they're dishonest people. Okay. Uh, so yes, please. You didn't Mr. answer my question, Mr. President. Mr. President. Go ahead. Please. You didn't answer my question, Mr. President. Uh, so if he did lie about his drinking, does that mean you'll pull his I don't think he did. Okay. I, uh, look, here's, here's what. I'm just saying, I'm not a drinker. I can honestly say I never had a beer in my life, okay? Right. It's one of my only good traits. I don't drink. <laughs> Whenever they're looking for something good, I say, I never had a glass of alcohol. I've never had alcohol. I've just, you know, for whatever reason. Can you imagine if I had? What a mess I'd be? Would I be the, I'd be the world's worst. Well, but I never drank. I never drank, okay? But I can tell you, I watched that hearing. And I watched a man saying that he did have difficulty as a young man with drink. The one question I didn't ask is, how about the last 20 years? Have you had difficulty the last 20 years? Because nobody said anything bad about him in many, many years. They go back to high school. You know, I graduated from high school, and, and I, I, while I did not drink, I saw a lot of people drinking. They'd drink beer, and they'd go crazy, and, you know, they were in high school. They were 16, 17 years old, and I saw a lot of it. Does that mean that they can't do something that they want to do with their life? So. It's a very tough thing. I, I really believe that he was very strong on the fact that he drank a lot. And so I don't know where there'd be big discrepancy. Okay, so yes, go ahead, so please. Just to wrap please. up, can you promise you know to what? release you've really the had FBI's enough. report? Hey, you've had enough. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, Judge Kavanaugh said he was being targeted by Democrats. Has he made the process overly political? And how can you assure the American people that he'll be able to deliver impartial decisions. Well, you'll have to ask him that question, but I can tell you he's been treated horribly. But he's a good man. He's a good man with a judgment. great family. I think he's been treated horribly. Lindsey Graham was, I thought, terrific the other day. And he brought up one point that is now being discussed by a lot of people. And that's who is going to want to run for office, be in office, take an appointment of not just Supreme Court, but, you know, many many positions. I have right now 360 people that aren't being approved. They're very qualified. Nobody says they're not qualified, but Senator Schumer is not approving them because of resist and obstruct. It's much longer than ever in the history of our country, like I think double the time almost. It's far more people than anybody in the history of our country. Most of those people are routine approvals. These are people that gave up jobs. They gave up their life to come and serve our country. And Schumer and his group won't approve them. They're slow-walking them. 
Everything is going to 30 hours, meaning they take them out 30 hours. Person that's going to be approved, it's a disgrace. So when the judge brings up whether it's politics or not, I don't know, you'd have to ask him, but I can say this. He's been treated really, really horribly. But are you concerned please, go ahead. Color, please. Color I'm not concerned, no. Things. No, you know what I'm concerned? That we get great, great people on the U.S. Supreme Court. That's what I'm concerned. And I want to have great people. And I don't want to have to call people for any court and have them say, sir, it's such a great honor, but no thank you, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. That would be a sad day for our country. And we're going to come close to that. Because I know people now that say, I don't know how he does it. I don't know why he would have taken it. Nobody knew a thing like this could have happened. Mr. When, when Justice, now Justice Gorsuch, got approved, it was rough, but it was nothing like th what they're doing to this man and what they're coming up with. And in many cases, fabricating. Because as you know, many stories were pulled back and certain stories were pulled back that were horrible. What they're doing to this man and his family is very, very sad and very bad for our nation. Yes. Mr. President, you just said some senators are not angels, and you've seen some of them in I very would say some of them, yes. compromising situations. Yes. Could you tell us who and exactly what situation no, you've No, no. I, I think I'll save it for a book like everybody else, and I'll write it. <laughs> OK? I'm not giving it to you. Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, Mr. President, if the FBI finds other witnesses who can corroborate the account of any of the accusers, would that be enough for you I would, to... I would certainly look at that. I'm open. I'm open. Mm -hmm. I think he's a fine man. I think he's a great scholar. Mm -hmm. I so believed him. When he, when he said what he did, he focused on being number one at Yale, on being number one in high school, at being number one at law. He focused. I can so understand that. I mean, it's, it was such a, it's so important. The way he said that, it, w it made an impact on me. He was so focused on being number one at Yale. And I believe he was number one at Yale. But I understood that very well. And I wanted to ask about something else you brought up today, the Las Vegas shooting. Yes. Um, there's some frustration that more hasn't been done in that past year. More hasn't been done about bum stocks. Are there some well, we, things no, no, you would like wrong, to see done? No, no, you're wrong about yeah, that. So in order to uh, eliminate terminate bump stocks, we have to go through a procedure. Uh, we are now at the final uh, stages of that procedure. In fact, the lawyers were just telling me, and over the next couple of weeks, I'll be able to write it out. But you can't just write it out, because rules and regulations in this country are really tough, even for something like that. So we're knocking out bump stocks. I've told the NRA, I've told it, bump stocks are gone. But to do it, you have to go to public hearings, which we've had. You have to go through all sorts of regulatory control systems. And we are in the final couple of weeks, and I'll be, is, is our attorney around someplace, please? He said, we're in the final, we're in the final two or three weeks, and I'll be able to write out bump stocks. But it's a process that takes, statutorily, it takes about a year to do it, and any other to do it properly. Any other actions um, you're planning to help prevent? Yeah, and we're like working this? also with Congress on both sides. We are, we are working on a lot of different things. Having to, that was a horrible thing. But we're working on both sides of that question. And the bump stock uh, is almost gone. But again, to do it so it, it's meaningful, the lawyer just said it. Yeah, we've gone through a whole procedure. If you look, in fact, you could, you could call Derek, who you know very well. And uh, he's gone through the full procedure. We've done it absolutely by the book. And in a very short period of time, bump stocks will be ruled out. Okay? All right, thank you. Yes. You, you've had one? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, go ahead, please. Please, 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 sit down. M That's Mr. True. President, That's a true. final trade question. Uh, since steel and aluminum tariffs won't be coming down from Canada and Mexico, can you talk about whether there was discussion of ending those retaliatory tariffs against U.S. Well, they're not retaliatory. Ranchers? They're really um, trying to get some really bad things from happening. They were dumping in our country. And it was China and various others were dumping massive amounts of dead steel. It's called dead steel. It's also imperfect steel. Inside that steel was a lot of bad things that make for a weaker steel. So when we're building bridges and you have mud steel or you have other quantities of other material in that steel, that's a very bad thing. It's very unsafe. So it's not just economic. It's, you know, we have, the miners have been very thankful for what I've done. You saw that the other night in West Virginia. And we have uh, metallurgic 
coal and other materials. We have mines that are opening up now to get that incredible stuff. This is used not for heating and cooling. This is used in electric. This is used to make steel. And those mines are now opening up, and we're making steel. And the price is going to end up being less because we don't have the shipping problems when you ship it from places so far away. You'll see. We'll have hundreds of new plants opened up in our country, and they'll be competing against each other. And outsiders won't be able to compete. Just so you understand what was going to happen, they were going to knock out every steel plant we had. And then they were going to double and triple the price, and we couldn't have done anything about it. It's a very dangerous thing. And we've employed a lot of people. And billions of dollars is now flowing into our Treasury. Okay, uh, yeah, in the back, please. Please. Um, staying here on, on trade, the stock market has liked the announcement today. When we walked in here, the Dow was up 250 points or so. There are some who are worried that because of the threat of future tariffs, it could potentially stifle an economy that is hot, a stock market that is hot. But yet today, you have once again said, hey, as it relates to China, more tariffs could be coming down the line. Are you worried that potentially you are somewhat suppressing no, this economy no, from running no. further? No, I'm using them to negotiate. And hopefully, we can make a great deal with China, a fair deal and a reciprocal deal, but a great deal and a fair deal. We have a lot of catching up to do with China. You know, when they drain us for $500 billion a year, which is probably the real number, and that's not including the theft of intellectual property and other things. And a lot of people say it's hard to value, but a lot of people say that could be $300 billion a year. That's a tremendous — you can't let — you just can't let that happen. No, uh, we're using tariffs very successfully to negotiate. And if we're unable to make a fair deal, then we'll use tariffs. But Mexico and — if you look at Mexico and Canada, they're way beyond that. We have a deal that really works. And the nice part about the deal we make with them is it's not a specific product. It's a product all across the line, whether it's dairy or, t you know, just a lot of — a lot of — you see the list of products. There are many, many products. And they're all included. So it's across the board. Mr. President, with, with China, one more on trade, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, Mr. President, um, if the FBI does find something and Brett Kavanaugh fools, is there a plan B? I don't want to talk about plan B, because I think — I hope that he gets approved. I hope that the report comes out like it should — like I really think it should. I think it will. I hope. I hope. But look, I'm waiting just like you. Certainly, if they find something, I'm going to take that into consideration. Absolutely. I, I have a very open mind. Uh, the person that takes that position is going to be there for a long time. I have a very open mind. I just think he's an outstanding person. I think he has been treated horribly. Even if you were going to bring up some of the subjects that were brought up, they didn't have to treat him so viciously and so violently as they've treated him. Can I just ask okay. well, on, on trade? Thank you all very much. You Thank you. Is. Thank you very much, everybody. You have been watching President Donald Trump deliver his remarks on the trade deal that was reached in the 11th hour between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. The president spending the better part of uh, almost an hour uh, talking about the trade deal and delivering some remarks. He also praised uh, his trade representatives as well as the ambassador uh, to Canada, who uh, he says helped make the deal happen, as well as his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who is the president's uh, a special advisor to the president. Uh, but he did get a lot of questions towards the end of this impromptu press conference uh, about Brett Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court nominee's um, path forward, shall we say, as the FBI begins an investigation into allegations that he sexually assaulted uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford uh, back in the early 19. 80s. Um, Paula Reed is joining us now. Uh, she was there during this uh, press conference. 
Um, so, Paul, a lot of questions certainly about trade. The president wanted to stick to the topic at hand. But then, of course, the questions surrounding Brett Kavanaugh. And there are a couple of things that I found sort of striking and interesting that I, that, you know, that I wrote down. It, it struck me that the president uh, seemed to indicate that he was surprised by the amount of drinking that Brett Kavanaugh did. The president saying that he never has touched a drop of alcohol in his mm -hmm. life. Um, and that he went on to say that, or he seemed to indicate that it, it struck him that Brett Kavanaugh had some type of a drinking problem. The other thing that he said is he does believe the FBI should interview Brett Kavanaugh, but that he was going to leave it up to them. I want to get your thoughts. That's right. Well, the big question of the day is, is the White House putting any limitations on the extent to which the FBI can conduct what is basically a supplementary background check? And the president would not directly answer the question of whether the White House had put any specific parameters on that. But what he said publicly was he has no problem if they want to interview all three accusers. He has no problem if they want to interview uh, Judge Kavanaugh. He just wants anything that is done to be done quickly. But the FBI has said that they are being limited by the White House, that they do have restrictions that have been dictated by the White House. But here the president in the Rose Garden today saying that he is not putting on any restrictions, that he will do whatever the Senate wants. So ultimately the question is now, well, where does the FBI take its marching orders? Do they take it from, from this podium in the Rose Garden or do they take it from uh, Don McGahn, who we believe is the person who has been instructing them on how far they can go with this supplementary background check? It's an interesting question. Uh, Paula, stand by. I want to bring in Major Garrett, uh, who is also joining me, I uh, believe, from the Rose Garden. Uh, so, Major, um, again, I'm struck by uh, the president who, as you know, as, as well as most Americans, does not like to drink or doesn't drink at all and does not generally like people who drink. Uh, and I'm quoting the president here. Um, he said, I can honestly say I've never had a beer in my life. Uh, but he also said this. I was surprised by how vocal, meaning Brett Kavanaugh, how vocal he was about, about the fact that he likes beer. Uh, he said he, in the, quoting the president, he did have difficulty as a young man with drinking. Brett Kavanaugh seemed to try to indicate the opposite or convey the opposite when he was sitting in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Right. And what the president was trying to do was say he was vocal, meaning he was willing to discuss it. Therefore, he did not contradict himself or say something that under oath could later be disproven, meaning he was lying under oath, which would be in most White Houses, a significant issue to consider for someone nominated to a lifetime appointment on the United States Supreme Court. The president also went on a rather rambling discussion of other people in the Senate, perhaps here in the Rose Garden, who might have problems, who might have issues. Of course, not one of those individuals nominated to hold a lifetime position on the United States Supreme Court. And this really is sort of an underlying question. Is that disqualifying? During the campaign and during the nomination of Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, President Trump and Canada Trump said the Supreme Court is a very special place. The highest standards apply. Well, if the highest standards apply and there are things you said under sworn testimony that other people who say they were eyewitnesses of your behavior, take for example excessive drinking, say you're lying about or those things are not true, is that by itself disqualifying? The president never got around to that answer at all. And this creates a possible uncomfortable <coughs> nexus for the White House because if the president says, well, yes, he seemed to have some issue with alcohol, and there are those witnesses who say Brett Kavanaugh could become aggressive and sometimes disoriented from drinking too much alcohol, does that undermine his blanket denial of any of these accusations of sexual misconduct or sexual assault? This is very touchy terrain, both as a matter of law, as a matter of process, and possibly as a matter of politics. But I would say this, Vlad, the two most important messages sent by this White House today and President Trump was quickly and, not, and Kavanaugh has been treated horribly and viciously, meaning the process has been unfair to him and he wants the FBI to move as quickly as possible. Those things still indicate that this White House expects and believe an FBI report in the not too distant future and Senate Republicans to move on the Kavanaugh nomination sooner rather than later. And Major, uh, two other points about that that struck me is one, he was asked directly a question about whether Don McGahn uh, was sort of overseeing this and would he direct Don McGahn to allow the FBI uh, the full weight of its powers to investigate all these allegations, the president answering questions around that. And the, the other thing, Major, that I thought was sort of interesting is once again, the president sort of reflecting back what is 
happening in Brett Kavanaugh's life through the prism of his own experiences in suggesting that uh, he was being treated unfairly, that he understands what Brett Kavanaugh is going through. Well, to this last point that you just made, Vlad, the president used the word trauma. The trauma inflicted on Brett Kavanaugh and his wife and his family. Drawing from this White House's perspective, if not a moral equivalence, a moral relationship in the pain suffered by all protagonists in this ongoing Supreme Court nomination and confirmation drama. But to your first question, Vlad, because it's very important, not just as a matter of process, but as a matter of executive power in relationship to the legislative branch. The president just said the United States, everyone in this country, I'm deferring to the Senate Republicans on what the FBI should do. Essentially, handing over his executive powers to the Senate Republicans. And the chairman of that Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate Majority Leader, Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, have made it fundamentally clear they want to see Brett Kavanaugh confirmed. So the FBI, by the words of the President of the United States, is taking its directives or its outlines from Senate Republicans the leadership of which have already said they want to see Kavanaugh confirmed, that suggests an orientation to the scope and timing of this investigation. And for those on the Democratic side who think it is a mere procedural delay, in advance of a foregone conclusion, the president's own words would certainly give them evidence to, if not confirm that suspicion, at least point to it. All right, Major Garrett reporting for us for, uh, from the Rose Garden, where we just heard uh, President Trump speaking. Major, as always, we thank you. Thank you. Paula Reed is still with us uh, from the White House lawn. Uh, uh, Paula, so uh, again, this question as to the scope and the scale of the investigation that the FBI is undertaking over the next couple of days, the president's saying that he wants it wrapped up quickly, but he also did say that he wants it to be comprehensive. It seems to me, or at least, to some that that might not be possible given the time frame, but there are others who say that the FBI um, has enormous resources and they can field a lot of agents to get to the bottom of whatever it is they're trying to uncover. Well, let's remember, this is the seventh time the FBI has done one of these background checks. This is not a traditional criminal investigation where they're trying to figure out what happened and if charges should be filed. They were just supplementing his background check. The White House is, in effect, a client, and they're doing some research. And in this instance, the questions are pretty narrow and specific. The big issue is how many witnesses. Uh, last night at 60 Minutes, it was suggested that there were up to 20 witnesses uh, who could be interviewed, how many of those they interview, and how many of these claims they delve into right now. There are three uh, claims, one from a woman named Julie Swetnick, which has come under some scrutiny about whether or not she is sufficiently credible to warrant uh, FBI uh, investigation into her claims. So that's what the clarity that people are trying to get from the president is, have you authorized the FBI to look into all three of these claims? But the idea that this could take a week, I mean, it just depends how many people they want to interview how many claims they're going to investigate. And from this press conference, it is not clear, because while the president was sort of giving them carte blanche um, from the podium, that is not what has been communicated from the White House to the FBI uh, so far. And we saw sort of quick leaks out of the FBI this weekend. It was clear they wanted to send a signal that they were not able to do everything they wanted to do. So it'll be interesting to see as the day goes on if there are additional conversations between the White House and the FBI to open this up, and what, if any, role the Senate also plays in trying to give the FBI more broad authority to investigate these claims. You know, it'll be interesting, Paula, because uh, the president was asked very specifically about these questions mm -hmm. with regards to Mr. Kavanaugh's uh, drinking habits, mm -hmm. uh, both when he was a younger man um, and in the later years in college, for example. And so if, if it turns out that he basically lied to the Senate Judiciary mm -hmm. Committee, that, is that considered perjury? Because I'm trying to um, sort of reconcile the report that was leaked from Rachel Mitchell, the prosecutor, mm -hmm. who poked a lot of holes in Dr. Ford's um, testimony, essentially saying that there are a couple of key things that she could not remember, and there are some people who could not recall ever having been in the party that yeah. she says she was at. But that's just memory, right? This is now, you're talking to, you're uh, testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and if the FBI figures out that you were lying about that, that's perjury, am I right? 
Uh, yes, if you are, if you do lie uh, under oath, that is that is perjury, and that's why people were trying to pin the president down. It appears that it may be very difficult um, to pursue Dr. Ford's claims or any of these other claims too far because it does sort of boil down into a he said, she said, unless there is more corroborating information. So it seems that the political question has sort of shifted to this issue of, of Judge Kavanaugh possibly perjuring himself based on his own assessment of his drinking uh, in high school and in college. But again, I think we need to go back and look at how he characterized it. Uh, at one point, he was very defensive. He was very combative, but I think it's fair to say that many people may not have uh, a very honest or um, objective assessment of their relationship with alcohol. So I think we start to get into really kind of uncharted territory about whether or not someone should be kept from a Supreme Court seat because they did not provide an honest or accurate assessment of their relationship with, high, with uh, alcohol in high school or college. I, I mean, it is fascinating, but it does seem that the conversation will shift um, from these claims of sexual assault to this question of whether or not he, he accurately represented uh, his drinking. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, Ron Hosko, former deputy director of the FBI, had a good point when we spoke to him earlier where he said, you know, that's kind of subjective when it comes to alcohol. Is, what, yeah. what you know, knocks somebody else out, which is, which is a couple of beers, um, <laughs> may not knock somebody else. You know what I mean? It's like hard to know yes. when you're talking about alcohol. Two beers for one person um, is a big deal and six mm -hmm. beers for another person is not such a big deal. Exactly, and many people just in getting outside the law, just just in, in life experience. I think many of us know people who maybe have problems with alcohol, who who don't have really an objective assessment of their own relationship uh, with drinking. And some people, like you said, for some people, it's also subjective. Uh, what may be you know knock me out may not knock you out, it may just give you a buzz. So again, it's very uncharted, sort of soft, uh, subjective territory. And I think a lot of people would have a lot of sympathy uh, for him on that issue, much more so than if there was any corroborating evidence about any of these allegations of sexual assault. All right, Paula Reed for us at the White House. Paula, as always, we thank you. Yeah. All right, we are going to take a very quick break. When we come back, I we'll have a whole lot more news. Oh, well, no, hang on. We've got the Prime Minister of Canada that is uh, speaking now. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Ottawa. He's talking about the new trade deal with the U.S. Let's listen. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, and thank you for your resolve and your leadership uh, and your patriotism. They have been at the heart of our work and the foundation of everything. I'm really grateful. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I want to start uh, by echoing the Prime Minister's sentiment and his thanks to everyone, uh, above all, our outstanding trade negotiators. Um, they are amazing, and I am very grateful, very, very grateful. And uh, I also want to thank the trade negotiators from the other two countries. Uh, this has really been 24-7 for a lot of people for a long time. Uh, people have gone above and beyond the call of duty, and I'm really, really grateful. I said when we began that there would be moments of drama, and there have been. Through it all, Ambassador Lighthizer has been a professional, reliable, and trustworthy counterpart. And I can say, especially after the past few weeks of very intense negotiations, what we called our continuous negotiation, he's someone I consider a friend. Thank you, Bob. Mexico's Secretary Ildefonso Guajardo has likewise been a valued and respected counterpart, and I consider him to be a friend, too. Muchas gracias, Ildefonso. So here's what today's agreement will achieve. Tout d'abord, et c'est la chose la plus importante, il maintient le libre échange à l'échelle du continent nord-américain ainsi que l'accès au sein du marché régional d'une valeur de 25 000 milliards de dollars, qui compte 470 millions de personnes et dont la taille a triplé depuis la création de Alena en 1993. En même temps, You've been watching a press conference there by the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, and Krista Freeland. Uh, she is speaking in French. So we are going to take a quick break. When they go back to English, we'll bring that to you. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Facebook's head of global safety, Antigone Davis, joins us now. Tell us about the charges that Facebook actively tries to get people addicted. There is a new push to crack down on scammers targeting elderly Americans. Mark Bordellini is chairman and CEO of Aetna. Is this going to bring down the cost of prescription drugs? Presented by GoDaddy. Figuring out a marketing strategy for your business can be daunting, especially if you're just starting to build your brand.